What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Cinema Center at Marvel at TIFF 2023. I am lucky enough to be sitting here with John Carney talking about one of my favorite films of the whole damn year, Film Love with Flora and Son at Sundance. And I was so happy you were bringing it here. So we had a chance to talk. Oh, me too. I'm, I'm delighted to chat. So I want to go back to the beginning with this and even back a little further, because I know you veered away from feature filmmaking for a little bit. What inspired that shift? And when you got back to it, were there any new tools that you were able to use on Flora and Son that you knew you gained from series storytelling? Oh, that's a cool question. Probably, yes. I, 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 the reason I stopped making movies for a while was that I needed to buy a house. So I went and made television, which got me enough money to buy a house and then I returned to filmmaking to get some furniture in the house. <laughs> this makes all <laughs> the sense of the world. Which gives you a sense of how big TV is and how but so Flora was a return as tiny small film a kind of return to my comfort zone of you know not a lot of money and cast I knew and friends of mine and crew that I had come up with um, and I think I probably did learn a lot by making you know Modern Love which was the TV show that you're referring to um you do learn to tell a story in a very succinct way when you're working with in TV that they were standalone episodes. So I think I learned a lot about um, getting scripts down to their bare kind of minimum and finding a way to tell a story very quickly and effectively and uh, and kind of getting on with it. And I think that probably shows in Flora's fairly it's a short enough movie you know it's not a huge long sprawling movie I'm ruining my roadmap here but because you just referenced the fact that you brought back a whole bunch of collaborators you have worked with in the past yeah. to make Flora and Son just because like everyone everyone knows you we're going to talk about Eve Joseph all those yeah. people can you give me an example of maybe someone behind the scenes that you have an established relationship with that I don't know might be a bit of an unsung hero and you want our audience to know about what they bring to your projects wow that's an well there a lot of people that I work again and again with um, Anthony Bregman, the producer, uh, one of the producers on on, on um, Flora, produced Begin Again and Sing Street, and we we now have clocked up quite a few films together, and will continue to do so. And then there were various crew members in Ireland <clears throat> that I had worked with. I've been working with for kind of years. We both started, you know, we many of us started making films just as a sort of a thing to do. You know, picked up a camera. One guy picked up a microphone, the other picked up a clapperboard, and you found out what job you were doing. You know, we didn't go to college, really. It was it was more like, I need you to do the makeup, or will you do this, or get sandwiches, and jobs became, kind of came out of necessity, which is a really interesting sort of way of working. Well, when you find those collaborators, and you know they're the yeah. real deal, the long-term ones, you stick with them. Yes. I love talking about how a film can evolve throughout the entire filmmaking process. So do you remember what the biggest difference is between Flora and Son Draft One and what mm -hmm. everyone will now see in the finished feature? Yeah, I can. I, I wrote that script and I paused on about page 50 or 60, and I didn't know which way to, I kind of let it sit there for quite a few months, actually, without an ending. Um, and I had every, all the characters were set up. And then I, once I knew it was going to be Eve, I, I figured out the way to sort of end it um, and where to go and to play to her strengths. She's a very funny person. And that was immediately evident. The second I kind of met her was like, well, she's going to go in always with the funny bone. And, and, and she's not afraid of goofing around and tripping up and trying different things and saying, well, that didn't work. And that, and I think that sort of led me to, to complete the script and finish it out knowing the, the, the voice of the, of the actor who was going to play Flora. I'd also read when you stopped after page 50, you also focused on the music. And I think the way you described it was initially like the music just, it wasn't right. So yeah. what did that music sound like? And when you found her and figured out the end of the script, how did the music evolve from there? So the music in this movie, usually with a mu musical, the, the criteria is give me the best song you have. That's all it is. You know, if a star is born or guys and dolls, like what's the best vibes or falling slowly in the film I did called once, just the best song you can write, please. Um, with this, it's slightly different because they have to be good songs, but they have to plausibly be from the Flora character who, let's face it, found a guitar at the beginning of this movie and never played before. So she can't suddenly be uh, Django Reinhardt, who was mentioned in the movie. You know, she can't suddenly be up and down the fretboard. Okay, so now her, 
her songs are probably going to be down here in G and C and F and she's probably not going to be dropping in sus and major seventh chords and jazzy stuff so that's an interesting and I didn't look at them as limitations but it was the character uh, that I had written was was forming the songs so that should tell you which direction to take the songs in and that took a while to figure out what sound she she's producing so 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 good so much that I can't get out of my head and I'm happy for it I wanted oh, to live there forever and ever um talking a little bit about Eve now and also actually all the leads you've worked with over the years you've had some pretty exceptional leads in a movie musical do you notice any shared qualities they have that make them excel with a film like this but then also can you name something about her that makes her one of a kind and stand out from the bunch yeah I, I think I'm probably looking for um actors for whom music it's the question that I ask of all of the actors when we're kind of getting down to is like what how, how much of a role does music play in your life? Because believe it or not, people, for some people, music is kind of background, which always amazes me. Um, and so I'm always kind of looking for the story in, in an actor's life where music really changed them or a song or, or, or a period of their life in which they grew or messed up or uh, got married or didn't get married what was the music playing what was the score of your life and I, I think I've always gravitated towards actors for whom music played a kind of a pivotal role in their in, in their life and then then that's it I don't go into that in too much detail on the set or anything like that but it's good to know that the person because my films I guess are kind of about music uh changing your life and uh so, so, so it's good to have actors who've had their own personal experience of that. And then how about something about her that stands out from any lead you've ever worked with before? Uh, so many things. She just, she, she, Eve is very unusual. She doesn't come at it like an actor uh, that I, or, or the actors that I've known. She's, she's perfectly studious. She learns her lines and she's an actor, but she comes at it from a slightly different perspective, which I really enjoyed. Um... And I'm not sure what it is that she's got, uh, but I, I haven't seen it, you know, in Mark Ruffalo or uh, like I'm trying to think of other actors that I've that I've worked with who have a, a very kind of, um, you know, went to acting school or, or she has, a, I guess what I'm trying to say is a more a little bit more of the lead singer of a band, a little bit more of a rock star. Uh, let's face it, just her approach to things is a little bit like. It reminds me when she's talking, it reminds me of bands I've been in or lead singers that I've met. Just the, they, they think in three minute increments or something, like the length of a song. Like that's not, I, I'm not, you know, I know I'm not going to be able to do that or that doesn't ring true or to, just a funny musical sort of approach to the thing. And then her humor was the other thing that drew me to because the character is funny and she, she was not in any moment. She never said, can I look back at that? Because I think I made a fool of myself. She was like, you can have that take if you want it. Yeah, I was reading a lot about how she is game to do just about yeah. anything. Can you give us an example of a surprising big swing she took on set? You loved it, rolled with it, and now everyone can see in the finished yeah, film. Yeah, I think that she had just done Bad Sisters, and I think hanging with Sharon and all of those great actors, she was, uh, they had probably, I don't know, but it seems when you're watching that show, they were just having a brilliant time making that show. Um, so she was very up for like, I'll try I don't know if I'm this or that or if I can do this funny, but there were definitely a couple of episodes we would arrive on set and myself and Eve would be a little bit like, I'm a bit bored today. I was, let's do it funny just for our own entertainment. What about tripping up and like trying to go underneath the wall? Like there were certain scenes where, you know, with the ex-boyfriend with Jack Rayner, her ex-husband, where she had to try and have poise, but, but didn't because she's, the wounded woman coming back to drop the kid off or something. And she was very funny and very open to letting him have the scene and her kind of play the fool and not, not have to try and get it back off him. And there were numerous episodes, I think, where, where myself and Eve would look at each other and kind of have a little code, which is like, do something funny. This scene needs, it needs some, we need to take the air, you know, it's, 
She was really good at that. I get the impression that she could do absolutely yeah. anything. And, yeah, and af right. after this, I just need her to be the lead of more and more feature yeah, films hopefully. in the future. I have to talk about Joe briefly because I had heard that, I think he said this actually, that initially you were thinking maybe you wanted to cast a professional uh, musician in right. that role. Did you have any particular musician in mind? And then what did he write in that letter to you that convinced you otherwise? So, so um, you know, like it doesn't take much convincing to get Joe, you know, in your movie. We would all love to work with Joseph Gordon-Levitt, but it's that I had this idea that he was somehow very good looking and sophisticated and polite. It was just a thing I had that if I thought of him, I was like, oh, he's the good guy and, you know, he wears ties and he looks good. And I'm talking about a, you know, sun suntanned L.A. hippie who's been, fa you know, who's failed in his career and lives up in Topanga Canyon or wherever. And I just was like, isn't he a bit clean cut? And aren't you, and he was like, no, I, I, I know LA, I know this guy. And he, he just spoke so well about music. And he spoke about his own wife and the way that they sing together. And he talked about harmonizing with your partner, which really spoke to me. And I felt like here is a guy who, who knows this character in a way that I didn't even really know him when I kind of wrote him. Uh, and he, he was like, you don't, it's very, very nice when a director, when an actor comes to a director and says, you don't see that you have something here. Let me point this out to you. And you can, as a director, it's very humbling and inviting to go, oh, I didn't see that. And you're grateful because an actor has shown you something that you didn't know you had in a, in, in a script or an idea. And Joe did that in numerous times because he is, let's face it, has 50 times more experience than I do. So lots of times I'd be like, he's, he's Joe, he's, you know, uh, yes. <laughs> oh, I want to go down that path a little more now. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll phrase it this way. Yeah. Going into filming, which character were you most excited to work on and dig into? But then to lean into what you were just saying, which character wound up being more f more creatively fulfilling than you ever could have imagined because of what the actor brought out of what you had written? Well, I tell you, Jack Rayner uh, brought some great stuff to that part because that part could have been, you know, the the the, you know, he's an he's a he's an ex husband. He he. Uh, you know, he's, he, he doesn't want to take the kid and look after the kid at the weekends. He's a, maybe a bit of a slob. He's a bit of a dreamer. He maybe was in a band and it didn't work out. He's a bit disgruntled and unhappy. You could play that in a kind of a, like, I think there's four or five scenes with that character in the movie. And Jack somehow has a very clever way of inhabiting sometimes these characters, certainly with me anyway, he played in Sing Street. He played the lead character's brother. He makes a small character grow in a very, very cool way without needing extra dialogue or without ever asking me to like, can I do more? Can I be in more scenes? He breathes life into these small characters or secondary characters. Um, so I just can't wait to do something bigger with him. I would very yeah. much like to see that. I yeah. I love that he makes the most out of every minute of screen time that he gets, but I need to see him yeah. like powerhouse lead front and center. That's a good way to put it, that he's the kind of actor who you look forward to in the seven scenes that, you know, I think of tons of those actors that are like, oh, you're going to make something of this scene. It's not just going to move the plot along. Now my brain is flooding with examples. Um, I wanted to touch on something. I think you might have said this in a previous interview or my press notes or something, but I love this idea. It's something that I think about a lot. And I think you were talking about what you wanted people to take away from the movie. And you said the beginning of something, but not the completion. Mm -hmm. How do you go about knowing that your movie gives a full and satisfying experience, but while also leaving the door open for audiences to consider what happens next? Wow, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I do know what you I, I do know what I meant when I said that. I think that it's um, I try to avoid the idea that like, oh, this is the end of the movie and everything is finished because stories never finish. You just choose a point at which to jump off. And uh, I, you could choose to end on page 78 or you could go one more page or you could go five more pages or you could go into the next day for this character. And I think for me, the the challenge of making a movie is how you begin it and how you end it 
And that's what makes it distinct from TV, which goes on and on and on and on and draws you in and seems to never end. I mean, that's the, a film has to, you begin and without a bathroom break or a week break or a tea, a tea break, you're going to, you begin and then you're going to end and the audience are going to believe you or not and trust you. And I find that the point at which you're going to bring down that, that blade on the end of the movie and make that final cut, to me, it's better when you don't make a big statement about that ending and wrap it all up and have everything finished. But that when you go, this character got some satisfaction there in that scene, but it doesn't mean that tomorrow is not going to be a challenge. And I didn't want to do a thing about, you know, Flora from the flats who has all these challenges and suddenly she finds a guitar in her whole life. She's like Beyonce or she's winning awards. I wanted to make it that she had taken this step in her life towards something new, but she's still going to have challenges the next morning. She's still going to have to pay her rent and she's still probably going to scream to her son and they're probably going to argue, but they're better. And they've made some steps towards repairing their, their the damage that, that, that let's face it, she's done in their relationships. That's what makes it feel real and mean more. And that's right. what that's what keeps it on your mind well after the movie ends too. And yeah. I appreciate that very much. Yeah. It's thinking like, where could that go? Or where could that go? Or where could this go? Yeah, it's, it's giving that to the audience so that they don't feel they've been given a box with ribbon on it and it's all tied up and done. Do you have yeah. any itch whatsoever to make a sequel to any of your films? I thought about it, but I, I thought about Sing Street would be a funny sequel because you could take the characters in London when they probably went out there at the end of that film, like 80, what year is it? 86 or seven or something like that. So you could set a film in London in the late 80s or early 90s. But musically, I didn't think things were as interesting Fair. for me then. And then I thought of a sequel to Once, but then, I don't know. I'll, I'll probably just disguise it in another film and have, call them have different names or something like that but no it's nice to end and just yeah, be done with it I get, yeah. I get it but when i fall in love with something i get greedy and want more of it well then the, the really great example of that the only one that works for me is the link later movies mm. and that's they're like example. that's so i'm so glad that and it, the 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 other two two and three don't take from one but they also don't you know but they do work as a as a as a continuing saga or a story. But I don't normally I like a film to just it ends and that's it. You don't get any more. I'm sorry it is over. <laughs> Very much understand that. You bringing up Sing Street gives me an excuse to ask a question. You've probably moved on from this, but I think about it nonstop, and I'm still very sensitive about the fact that. That was probably one of the biggest Oscar snubs of all time. I'll oh. never stop thinking about it. <laughs> I. Was it a surprise to you when it didn't get the original song nomination? And why do you think it was shut out that year? Because for the life of me, even after all these years later, I can't process it. Well, I tell you, I never got into filmmaking to even of think course, about any of, of that. So, so, and it's very important for me to having had the luck of once winning an Oscar. That was never the plan. And so it's very important as a filmmaker to try and never go for that again because it is going to limit your work. And you're, if you start, to, and it's very tempting to go, God, we actually were in that room and there's an award. Maybe we could, you know, go down that path. So anything that we, any love that my films have gotten is a surprise to me, because I expect them to be, as my early films were broadcast in my mother's front room to seven of my friends. That's the most I expect from any of my films. So when anything happens, but I think the reason it's not a good thing when you've made a small musical in Dublin and then Damon Chazelle releases a musical. That does not help. A very good musical. <laughs> I still feel like it deserved it deserved that at the very least nomination. It is well, Sing you know Street what? and they Wild can, Rose that weighs heavily on my mind. They can maybe mind. give me like a lifetime achievement and say we missed. I'm that behind we that. Should have, when I'm like 90. <laughs> Sign me up to support um, that. I'll be there. <laughs> I wanted to refer to one other quote you gave in our press notes. I have to read this because it's so specific. You were talking about how the idea for Flora and Son originated. And you said, no matter how rich I may ever become in this world, I will always stop at a dumpster to see if there's anything there for me. You found an amp and that's what got the ball rolling on this. What is the latest thing you have found in a dumpster <laughs> and could it wind up becoming a movie down the line? That's a very good question. I did... Actually, really funnily, I, I, um, 
I was trying to explain that to somebody the other day and they were saying, why, 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 uh, why didn't you make a story about the amp? And I was like, well, an amp is a thing that you, you need something else to, to, to amplify. I could, so I traded that out for a guitar because it's its own thing. It's like a bicycle. You don't need anything else to make an acoustic guitar make noise. Um, but I, then I did actually have a very funny image the other day. I was walking along. Or I said, that's what I said. I said, like, when you see somebody walk down the street, they're interesting. But if they have a guitar on their back, they're twice as interesting or so true. Do you know what I mean? It's something about a musical instrument tells you, Oh, there's a dreamer. There's somebody who thinks that she can perform. There's somebody who has a dream of a song that suddenly this instrument gives, it's a great prop in a movie. It suggests all these stories to me, but I did really funnily walk down the other day and there was a guy walking and he had two guitars over his shoulder. <laughs> and, and I was like, is that twice as interesting? Cause they were literally, he just found two guitars and was carrying them. And I was like, you know, and actually what I realized is it's actually not as interesting because he looks like he's trying to sell them now. Oh, that's curious, but though. He found two <laughs> guitars and was walking down the street carrying them. Now my mind is spinning out of control with the narrative possibilities there. I'm going to end with one question about your next film, because I know it was very important uh, to you to set Flora and Son in Dublin. Yeah. I believe with your next film, you're going back to New York. What is it that's calling you back to New York City right now? Well, maybe I am. It depends on whether I can get financing or not, but I'll, maybe I'll find that out now in Toronto. We um, manifest things here. You yeah, will get exactly. financing. Yeah, yeah, I can go out cap in hand at the end of the screening. <laughs> um, there's a couple of projects and one or two of them are set in New York. I mean, it's still, even though I guess probably not the artistic center of the universe at the moment because everybody's been priced out and the kids aren't there and they're not doing their thing. Same as Dublin. It's just not happening. And it's primarily because there's no young people are there. No people can, you know, young people can't afford to do anything there. So it's that old story. So where, what the next city is, I have no idea or the next town or whatever, but that is a problem with New York for sure. So you kind of have to make up your own stories when, when, when you're there. And they, they also now like, I don't know, it's hard to, it, for, for me, it's like, you don't want to be making something that is claiming to be the next big thing because who knows what the next big thing is musically because it's moving so fast and fair know. yeah it's fair, fair to think about it that way but every single movie i know that's coming up and has your name on it i know it's going to fill a very particular place in my heart that oh, i can't great. get enough of i'm so happy to have it yet another movie from you to watch over and over and Thank over you very much. huge congratulations Thank on you. Florence, son. to I'm everybody out it. there keep an eye out for the movie trust me do not miss it and stay tuned for more interviews from tiff 2023